Hi everyone, we'll be in a few minutes, so stay tuned. Hi everyone, let's start the session now. Let me share my screen. I uh, hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, so we warmly welcome you all to the second round se uh, session table by uh, WSO2, which is on how to design a good REST API, tools, techniques, and best practices. So I'm Kavishka Fernando, senior software engineer from WSO2, and I will be the presenter today. The floor will be open for questions after the presentation, and Nuan Dias, a senior director from WSO2, will join us as the moderator. So today we will be talking about data model, resource model, resource URIs, proper naming, versioning, HTTP methods, pagination, security, REST API specification formats, tools, and something that we can't forget, async APIs. So when uh, creating a RESTful API, there are some major steps that we should follow. So first, a model of the data to be manipulated by the APIs need to be created. Then from this data model, the resources of the APIs need to be decided. So there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the data model elements and the resources of the API, because there can be new kinds of resources that will be introduced in the future. Right? So each of these uh, for each of the resources, the representations supported by the APIs have to be decided. Next, these resources must be named properly by means of URIs, also known as uniform resource identifiers. Then for each of the resources, the HTTP methods used to perform the required application functions have to be decided. So this also includes the use of uh, things like the applicable HTTP headers. So in case there are special be behaviors in your API, you need to decide whether you need any special behaviors for your application. For example, stuff like concurrency control, long running requests. Finally, you need to check the potential error situations. So if you identify potential error situations, you need to design corresponding error messages for this. So we'll have a look at what about data models. So the data model is an important source to determine an appropriate resource model. So the main purpose of the data model uh, behind an API is to specify the properties of resources that can be manipulated by an API in a more abstract or implementation independent manner. So the data model behind an API can be specified by a conceptual data modeling language, for example, something like entity relationship model or even UML uh, class diagrams. So now let's have a look at resource model. The resource model specifies the resources that are processed by the API. So several kinds of resources will be derived from both the data model as well as the corresponding processing requirements. 
There are four types of resources that we are going to look at today. Atomic resources, collection resources, composite resources, and control resources. Let's have a look at atomic resources. So the most basic vision to be made for deriving resources is identifying entities of the data model that are exchanged as a whole throughout the API. So these entities that we identify are called atomic resources. If you look at an example, the custom entity will become an atomic entity here. So this is because the details about a customer, like his address, payment information, can be accessed in several scenarios that we need throughout the usage of the API. So next, let's have a look at collection resources. So the next addition to be made is for the atomic resources of the same type are needed to be grouped together. So if we decide to bundle uh, such atomic resources together, they become collection resources. So for example, products will become a collection resource because the application supports a catalog that allows browsing through subsets or a list of all of the products available. So as another example, we can look at items. So items will become a collection resource as well, and it will represent all the items contained in the shopping cart of a, uh, for a certain customer. So this collection can be scoped. So we can scope it so that only items in a specific shopping cart are of interest to us, and we don't really need to consider about the items in all the shopping carts. So whenever the API supports creation of an instance of one of the entity types of, uh, of the data model, this entity type may result in a co corresponding collection resource. So for example, a new customer may register with the application resulting in a new instance of the customer entity type. So customers will become a collection resource. Now let's have a look at composite resources. So sometimes instances of groups of different entity types uh, need to be changed or manipulated as a whole because these instances are usually considered as aggregates. So these types of resources are collectively retrieved or deleted. So such groups become composite resources. For example, a shopping cart is a composite resource because it's often retrieved or delete as a, deleted as a whole. Um, so now let's have a look at controller resources. Controller resources are used when multiple resources have to be manipulated in a single API call in order to maintain data consistency. For example, deleting uh, each individual item of a shopping cart one after the other may result in consistent uh, problems. So sometimes you might get an error after deleting only the first few items and trying to retrieve your shopping cart. So it's easier if you can select multiple items and delete as once. So now we'll have a look at resource URIs. So the complete URI of an API follows a certain structure. So there's the scheme, followed by the host, followed by the base path, followed by the path, and there's an optional query string, as the example you can see here. So scheme defines the transport protocol supported by the API. Host defines the domain of the API. Base path uh, also follows a certain structure, like the feature code followed by the subcode followed by the version. So each base path consists of a feature code structure indicating the feature for which the API is for. So an optional subcode structure may be used for features containing logical independent collection of functionalities. So for example, the feature code may be APIM for API manager. Uh, so, uh, and if we have, uh, and the version might be something like v1.0. So if we have an independent publisher functionality like in WS2 API manager, uh, the, the URI may get a subcode assigned called publisher. So the base path will be the same for all the APIs of certain features or logically independent collections of features or functionalities. So now let's have a look at how we can properly name our resources. So you have to remember that atomic resources, collection resources, composite resources should all be named as nouns because we are trying to represent things and not actions. So we are trying to get a list of pets. So it's we have to define nouns for these resources. So if we want to define actions, or processing function resources and controller resources, they should be named as verbs because we are trying to represent actions here. So processing function resources and controller resources should not be sub-resources of individual other resources. So they should not be named by means of a URI template. And you should remember to make individual resources uh, parameters. So another thing that you should remember is 
try to use lower case uh, characters as much as possible uh, because this is not a mandate uh, or rule as such but we advise this as a good practice because sometimes it can be a bit confusing about which uri element names can be a bit case sensitive so if we are using multiple words to name a resource these words should be separated by dashes so try your best not to use underscore and we try our best also not to use camel case or other programming languages to name our resources so singular now should be uh, used for naming atomic resources whereas plural now uh, plural, uh, plural now should be used to name collections so we have to use the forward slash to specify hierarchical relationships between the resources as well. So the forward slash will separate the names of the hierarchical structured resources. So first we will have the parent name, which will be followed by the uh, child name. Now we will have, uh, have a look about versioning. So the version is specified as a pair of integers, usually separated by a dot, uh, referred to as the major version, minor version, followed by the patch version. And it is usually uh, preceded by the lowercase letter V, which defines version. So uh, the importance goes from uh, so patch version as the least important, whereas major version as the most important. So an incremental patch number means that the underlying modification to the API cannot be even noticed by a client. So the patch number is usually omitted from the version string. Only uh, the internal implementation of the API has been changed, while the signature of the API remains unchanged. So from the perspective of the API developer, a new patch number indicates a bug fix or a minor internal modification. So if you look at an in, uh, incremental minor number, it indicates that new features have been added to the API. But this addition must be backward compatible. The client can use these uh, old APIs as well without failing. For example, uh, API, the API may have added a new optional parameter or a completely new request. So if there's an incremented major number, it signals that changes are not backward compatible. So for example, a new mandatory parameter may have been added, uh, former uh, parameters may have been dropped, or completely form, uh, new, uh, complete uh, former requests are no longer available uh, through your API. So uh, it's a best, pra uh, best practice to usually support the current major version as well as at least one major version back. We should also remember that if a client is using an API's, uh, API's URI uh, with a version number that is no longer supported by your server, you have to respond. Your server has to respond with the response message 301 moved permanently and provide a location header field with the URI of the latest version of the API. So let's have a look at URI templates. Uh, URI template is an element which contains strings in curly brackets. So these strings are variables that must be substituted by the values that you uh, require in order to retrieve your information. So if you look here, shopping cart ID and item ID are variables that where you need to uh, substitute the shopping cart ID and item ID to get products of that specific shopping cart. So an op uh, optional query string is part of the URI and it contributes uh, for the unique identification of a resource. Uh, so uh, the query string consists of a sequence of name value pairs and they if you have multiple query strings you can separate them with an and so the query is usually defined with a name value pair which is separated by a equal sign if you look here we are trying to get uh, find uh, pets with the status available so our query string is status which equals to available so let's have a look at http methods so manipulation of resources in the rest style is done by create, retrieve, update, and delete operations, also called as uh, CRUD operations. So that map, uh, maps to the HTTP methods, which are post, get, put, and delete. Uh, so if you can see here, create is mapped with post, read is mapped with get, update is mapped with put, and delete is mapped with delete. So a request can be used without producing any side effect is called a safe request. So if there's a request that can be used multiple times and that is always producing the same effect as the first invocation, it's called an idempotent request. So let's have a detailed look, to about, a look about this HTTP methods. So get in HTTP as well as in the rest style is specified as a safe and idempotent request. So an API using the get method must not provide, uh, produce any side effects. 
So retrieving an atomic resource or composite resource is done by performing a get on the URI of your specific resource. So if you want to retrieve a subset of resources of a certain type, that is also done by performing a get on the URI of the collection of your resource. Uh, if we have a look at put, so uh, put substitutes or replaces the resource identified by the URI. So the body of the corresponding put messages provides the modified but complete representation of a, re a request that will complete substitute, uh, completely substitute the existing request or resource. So parts of the resource that have not changed also must be included in the modified resource of the message body. So especially make sure a put request must, must not be used for a partial update. So as a consequence to this, put is considered as, a, as an idempotent request, but it's not considered as a safe request. If we have a look at post, post is neither safe nor idempotent. So the main usage of posts are the creation of a new resource and the initiation of functions. Uh, so in order to create a new resource, a post request is used with the URI of the collection resource to which the new resource should be added. Uh, if the post request is processed successfully, the response uh, message will include a location header that will have the newly created URI of the added resource as, uh, resource as a value. So it also remember that it's a good practice to return uh, a last modified header containing the time the resource has been created, as well as the E tag or entity tag header uh, containing the entity tag of the new resource. So if you have a look at delete, a resource is deleted by the means of the delete request on the URI of the resource. Delete is usually an idempotent request. So uh, let's have a look at some of the main uh, status codes because there are a lot of status codes. So you can follow the uh, rest of the status codes from our white paper that has been published by WSO2. So let's have a look at the main status codes. So 200 OK defines that the request has been performed successfully. 400 bad requests says that the request is invalid. That means there can be syntax errors in the expression passed uh, with the request or values can be out of range or required data can be missing. So 401 unauthorized means that the request, uh, the client authorization on the past credentials are not accepted by the request. So the response must include a www authenticate header. Uh, so 403 forbidden uh, defines that the server understood the request but refused to perform it. 404 not found defines the requested entity does not exist. 406 not acceptable defines that the requested media type is not supported. So now let's have a look at pagination. So it is often convenient for us to retrieve large result sets in smaller chunks because it's easier for us to read, process, and understand. So the retrieval request specifies a query string that contains an offset field as well as a limit field. So the offset field defines the position number of a qualified resource where the retrieval should start. And the limit fields define the maximum number of resources to be returned. For example, if you've set uh, offset three and limit three, it will start with the third resource and only uh, give us three resources because we have specified the limit as three. So the response message with the subset of the qualified resor resources return should have uh, the three main fields that I'm going to mention now. A count field, which gives the total number of all qualified resources, a next field, a link to the next chunk of qualified resources, and also a previous field, which gives a link to the previous chunk of qualified resources. So if you look at this example, uh, we're trying to get products with an offset of 42 and limit 3. So we are going to get three resources since the limit is 3. And it's going to start with uh, the resource number 42. As you see here, we get P42, P43, and P44. And there is a link to the next subset. And there will be a link to the previous subset as well. Let's have a look at secu uh, security. So access to resources of an API are typically secured. So these resources should be accessible based on a properly designed permission model to prevent misuse of APIs. So access requirements can change. So we must make sure that we facilitate the ability to manage these permissions in a more flexible manner. For example, think that there's a user who created a shopping cart and he has the permission to create and delete an individual item from the shopping cart. So users, uh, there are a set of users who need special permissions to add new products or update existing product information. And there's a different set of users uh, who will get the permission to delete customers. For example, those who have a uh, bad credit standing. So to support all of these things, REST APIs need to support an extensible security mechanism. 
So if you look at security, there are it's of two types: authentication, which de defines who you are; authorization, which defines what you can do. So if you look at authentication, HTTP basic authentication, uh, it's a user. Uh, it uses username and password, which is Base64 encoded. It is more suitable for internal or business-to-business -business APIs. Uh, the next option is API keys. It's a one-time API key, which is more suitable for business-to-business -business API. So in this method, a unique generated value is assigned to each first-time user, and this API key is used to identify this user hereafter. So if you look at OAuth 2.0, which is open authentication, it's a de facto security for REST APIs, and it supports a wide range of ground scopes, uh, such as implicit ground scope, uh, uh, password grant, client credential. Uh, so it supports a lot of grant types and covers many application types as well. Uh, so if you look at authorization, what you can do. So uh, all 2.0 scopes are role-based access control. It's a role-based access control mechanism. So you can restrict users from accessing certain resources by binding them with the scope. So ZACML, or also known as Extensible Access Control Markup Language, it's a more uh, fine-grained control of access to resources, uh, but it is considered a quite complex uh, way to handle this. So it's an attributes-based access control mechanism, uh, and uh, access to a resource is determined based on attributes contained in the request message. Then we have OPA, which is known as Open Policy Agent. You can use OPA uh, to enforce policies in microservices such as Kubernetes, CI, CD pipelines, API gateways, and more. So OPA generates policy additions by evaluating the query input against the policies and data. So the next thing we are going to look into are REST API specification formats. So open API specification, it's a combination. It has compatibility with JSON and YAML. So Swagger is used to uh, both to generate API server code, uh, client code, and the documentation for these services as well. So the Swagger's feature set makes it a very popular choice. Uh, for APIs running across multiple platforms, environments, or revisions. So it is the clear when, winner when it comes to designing REST APIs. Our next option is YAML. So it's strictly YAML, uh, YAML in representation. So it's also a beast in the API documentation field. Uh, because of the way YAML is designed, it can support REST API documentation uh, in addition to documentation for APIs that don't precisely and strictly follow to REST standards, such as those utilizing other design architectures like SOAP and RPC. Um, next, we have Waddle, which uses uh, XML. It's uh, in incredibly time consuming to create descriptions with Waddle. And uh, the linking methodology is uh, quite complex when compared to OpenAPI or RAML. So next, we have API Blueprint, which uses Markdown uh, as its format. Uh, so um, additionally, where Raml and Swagger are both utilizing Java and JavaScript to pass, API Blueprint is speci uh, specifically focused on C++, Node.js, and C-sharp implementations. Uh, and we also have Slate. It is a completely customizable framework for building rich text editors, but uh, it's uh, not very tested or proven. It doesn't have a lot of tested or proven approaches because it has a very small user base. Um, so if you consider all these REST API specification formats, we can see that Open API uh, specification uh, is the clear winner of this. So there are uh, some set of tools that we can use to design our APIs. So Swagger API tools, which include Swagger Editor, Swagger Hub, there's Stoplight, there's OData Open API for OData APIs, OS, OAS tools, OS RAML converters. So you can visit Open API tools website to see uh, all the uh, converters and the different tools that you can use to design your REST APIs. So something that we can, can't miss when talking about REST APIs is about event-driven APIs or async APIs. So event-driven APIs enable apps to integrate many products and services based on equivalence around event-driven interactions. So async API is used to design and develop event-driven APIs like Kafka WebSockets. Um, so async uh, API was created to serve as a common unifying language for the diverse formats, protocols, and specifications, uh, which allows the standardized com uh, communication in the message-driven system. 
So just like open APIs, uh, uh, open API is used for SQL APIs, async API is used for event-driven APIs. So this brings us to the end of the basic REST API guidelines. For more information on how to design a good REST API, you can go and uh, see uh, the white paper on the REST API guidelines that we have published from WSO2. Uh, now I would like to invite Nuan uh, to op and open the floor for questions. Thanks, Kaushika. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. So uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, and guys, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do post them on the chat. So there's a question on will the presentations be posted on YouTube? Uh, and Mauro has replied saying yes. So I guess, yes, the organizers will uh, post this on YouTube uh, after once the conference is over. And they have, uh, uh, <clears throat> they have lots of uh, comments, uh, not questions, comments though from Craig uh, on the chat. So you can have a look at that. Um, he, he had some interesting suggestions um, and, and we were chatting about some usage of action resources and how to format them, usage of the underscore versus the dash and so on. Um, so yeah, there, there, was, uh, um, uh, there were some good uh, comments on that. And Mauro is asking any good uh, books or blogs recommended for API design. Um, so there was, let me quickly try to find, there was a book that was going around from Manning. Uh, I don't remember the name exactly now, but um, yeah, I think it's called the design of web APIs. So this is uh, probably a good book. So this is from Manning uh, publications. Um, so this, this I think is a good book. And also, um, uh, let me share the links to the slide here as well. Um, then in the slides at the end, you have we have a link to the white paper uh, that we have written. And the slides also have a lot more information uh, than what we uh, presented. And yeah, so Kavik has put the link to the white paper and you can find the slides here. Uh, uh, I just put the link to the slides. So, so in the in the slides, we also and in the white paper also we also talk about a lot of other things like uh, concurrency control, uh, caching, uh, and, and so on. Um, so, so there's a lot of inf other information as well. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, started or involved in microservices development. So, if you're into microservices, you'll definitely uh, if you're into microservices design, you'll definitely come across the need to do event-driven API. So instead of doing a, a request response for service-to-service -service communication, you'll definitely come across the need to uh, use event-driven APIs. Um, so if in case you haven't used async APIs yet, so it'll be a good starting point. So if you're starting new, uh, it'll be very good to start using this specification for, for the event-driven uh, APIs that you'll be uh, using or developing. In the future. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, yesterday during the PDT session, we, we presented the same uh, topic, and there was a question on the usage of uh, put versus patch. And um, yeah, so generally, uh, put is used for full updates, and patch is used for uh, partial updates. So, which it doesn't mean you can't use put for uh, a partial update. Certain implementations of the put uh, method support partial updates as well. But um, the, the general recommendation is to use put for full updates, and or rather we call we can call it replace and patch for partial updates. But implementing patch is uh, not very easy, especially when it comes to large kind of payloads. Uh, there's a question from Melissa asking, do you see other standards emerging for async APIs other than async API? Uh, that's what I hear the most, but not as yet adopted as OAS for REST. Yes, that is true. So for event-driven APIs, apart from async API, 
um, I haven't heard about any uh, specification, at least some, uh, nothing that's popular as, as that yet. So, and yes, the adoption is not uh, uh, as much as REST uh, as well. So uh, one reason for, for the, 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 the lack of adoption for this specification could be that these event-driven APIs, uh, in most cases, if you compare REST versus event-driven APIs, in most cases, this uh, event-driven APIs are useful for internal communication. So uh, people don't have a huge motivation to use a specification and you know go down that path because most of the time these communications are internal, so people think it's not very important. But in the case of REST, uh, most of the external communications happen over REST. Like if your mobile device is connecting to uh, some kind of service, it will be uh, using REST uh, over JSON and so on. So uh, in that case, of course, the, 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 the specification, the documentation is very, very important. Uh, so that could be one reason why the adoption is low. Uh, but I'm pretty sure based on how it's uh, trending and based on how the industry is moving into uh, adopting microservices uh, architectures, I'm pretty sure the adoption will uh, increase in the future unless there's a, a significant competitor who does a really good job uh, compared to async APIs. Absolutely. So <laughs> Melissa says I, uh, internal services should be just as well documented. Absolutely. I 100% agree. So that's why I recommended in the beginning. If you are going to use event driven APIs, just start with async APIs, even though you may not see a huge ROI right at this time. <clears throat> Uh, can you suggest, there's a question from uh, Dita asking, can you suggest what all should be considered when we start planning for integrating to a REST API? Um, so I, I, I guess what you're asking for is when you say integrate into a REST API, consuming a REST API. Uh, so one thing that, so depending on your client, so this, the, the client could be like a single page application, a mobile page application, a mobile application and so on. So uh, one is uh, SDKs. So this, if, if the REST APIs are based on open API, I guess they are, uh, they should be. So there are lots of SDKs available uh, that uh, your client can use. So you can uh, generate SDKs from the open API spec. There are lots of tools that allow you to do that. And you can use these SDKs in your, uh, in your client side that will make consuming these REST APIs a lot easy and another so that that is about the consuming part and then uh, it's very important to consider the security aspect so depending on who your client is especially if it's a, an external client or, or a public client or a public user um, uh, any kind of external user please use OAuth 2 uh, security so a lot of people start with uh, the easy protocols like API key or maybe even basic auth but uh, while these are suited for more internal things could be suited. OAuth 2 is always a better option. And even in OAuth 2, there are alternate grant types that can be used uh, just like you are using basic auth and so on. So as a best practice, uh, please start with OAuth 2 itself. Uh, so, and you'll definitely not regret it uh, as you move along. Um, yeah, so those are two of the, the, the things that I can uh, suggest you to begin with. But of course, there's things like rate limiting, uh, that comes into the picture, so we have to figure out how, how you want to use rate limiting and so on. Uh, uh, and then there's analytics and a lot of things, but to begin with, I think uh, you should look at the security and how easily you can consume this using SDKs. Okay, I guess we've uh, uh, we've come to, to the completion of our time so there could be other questions uh, i'm not sure but if, if you do have questions please do visit our booth so our booth is on the expo area so if you uh, look at your left hand side there's a button called expo and you can click that and click on the wso2 banner and come meet us at our booth and if you have further questions we can have a chat and if you want to know anything about uh, wso2 or api management identity uh, and so on, uh, we can have a chat. Um, uh, okay, so there's one more question. How can we make REST APIs performance? So uh, there are 
so i'll try to answer it real quick so there are some ways so one uh, easy way is to use caching so rest api is uh, so for example get request right so imagine you are doing a get request for a what uh, for a menu uh, in a restaurant right so this menu is not something that will be that will change so you can use uh, uh, caching and then there's these uh, things like e tag headers and so on so you can find these details in the in the white paper uh, you can use these e tag headers and so on to cache your responses so your browser won't be repeating the these uh, uh, these requests so that is one way of making uh, them performant uh, 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 and so if you're talking about the implementation of the of the rest apis again uh, api gateways can be used to to speed up uh, or, or used to uh, make your APIs perform better. So they can sit in front of your REST APIs and uh, do certain optimizations on how the data is fetched, how the data is cached, and how the data is uh, handed over to the clients. So that is also another way of uh, uh, increasing the performance uh, of your REST APIs. Um, and then uh, rate limiting and throttling. So this can also be used to make your REST APIs performant. Uh, based on how the traffic is distributed and how uh, your clients are treated uh, based on the rate limits uh, and so on. So these are some uh, uh, quick uh, 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 suggestions that I can come up with uh, right now. So, But if you go through the white paper, I guess you'll, you'll find a lot more tips uh, on how we can make these performant. All right. So... I guess uh, we'll leave the leave it there then. So thanks again, Kavishka, for the presentation, and thank you all uh, guys for for participating. And if you do want more information, please do visit us in our booth. Uh, thank you very much, and have a pleasant day. Thank you.